good evening everyone and welcome to the last session of the exoplanet course um, to begin with uh, a very happy science day to all and uh, for the last session we have with us dr abhijit chakravarti uh, from physical research institute uh, or physical research laboratory ahmedabad so dr ravi uh, request you to kindly introduce our speaker thank you praji welcome abhijit and welcome everyone uh, i'm very happy to introduce you all to uh, a professor uh, abhijit uh, chakravarti from uh, physical research laboratory uh, he's a head of the astronomy and astrophysics division and he's also the director for the pl 2.5 meter telescope he's one of the world's expert in the precision radial velocity uh, measurements so yes, project director actually oh yes yeah there you go project director there you go uh, and he's one of the world's most foremost expert in the precision radial velocity measurements. So it's uh, really an honor for us <laughs> to be here. Uh, Abhijit, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Okay, uh, can I start now? Yeah, yeah, please go okay. ahead. Okay, so uh, I'll be mainly discussing about the technique of precision radial velocity measurements. And um, so, um, please. So, uh, and, uh, so so if you want to, uh, you know, study stars, you do, we point the telescope to the star and, you know, either you do photometry or spectroscopy, you know, and get the photons and then study and this. But in case of planets, it's not that sure, that uh, easy, because the planet is very close to the host star and it is, uh, you know, like roughly 10, 10 billion to 1 billion, 1 to 10 billion times fainter than the star. So it is very difficult to uh, see. Say, for example, if there is an alien, is, say about 10 parsec or 30, 33 light years away from our solar system, and uh, the person is trying to uh, understand whether I see there's some echo, I think. Yeah, so we fixed it. So please go ahead. Sorry. For that. So if, if there is a, um, uh, if there is a pal, planets around the uh, sun, the, the person or the alien uh, creature will have no idea because uh, as you can see in this graph, that earth, the blue curve is almost uh, 10 million times fainter than the sun, sun. And so, you know, like that is the main difficulty that, uh, you know, like you can, uh, it's like looking a firefly, firefly against the light of a uh, lighthouse. So that's the problem. So fortunately, mother nature has provided us some of our ingenious technique, the laws of physics to figure out whether really, you know, like a planet is there or around the star or not. And one of them is the uh, Doppler rumbling effect. So uh, what is Doppler rumbling effect? So suppose, basically, you know, if you consider a planet around the, going on the star, it's actually they are going around uh, their common center of mass. But since the mass ratio is too huge, that is the planet is extremely small compared to the uh, the whole star, the, this common center of mass, uh, you know, like almost coincides with the center of the star. So the star wobbles. In this uh, cartoon, of course, which has been little oversimplified so that, you know, like the person can actually see it, uh, the motion. So when that happens, the, we can see the star's motion and which will make sure that and observing the star motion the uh, the the doppler velocities of the star we can say that whether you know there is any planet around it or not okay so uh, basically one basically use uh, kepler's third law and then uh, by you know, newton's law of gravity and then when you can see that the the mass of the planet is basically ratio is uh, is you know like uh, directly proportional to the amplitude of the oscillation of the star or the wobbling of the star. And uh, I'll just skip this. Okay. Um, so you know like if k k one is the uh, amplitude of the of the of the wobbling, then it is uh, equal to you know the uh, the m2 sin i by m1 okay assuming that m2 is much much smaller than m1 okay so you can see that uh, directly from k uh, uh, the k value actually represents the m2 sin i where the i is the projection angle of the orbit okay and and knowing the m1 that the star mass 
by some other method like stellar spectroscopy with a sufficiently precision accuracy of plus minus 0.1 solar mass, you can actually determine the mass of the planet pretty accurately. Okay, since my main topic is that instrumentation part, so I will mostly focus on that. So uh, the radial velocity is the only ground-based precise method for measuring mass of the planet down to super Earth. Of course, the other way method is the space-based astrometry. Some micro second better can in principle do the same job, but out of scope for Gaia because that probably has something around 10 micro second to 25 micro second pressure limit. So currently, if you want to measure fine super arts, the only way you can do it is to a radial velocity technique. The measure the mass. Okay, so uh, you can uh, let us have an idea of what could be the k value uh, of the of the you know the whole star because versus the mass of the of the planet. So if you see, for example, typically uh, is my cursor visible? Hello. Uh, yes. Yes. Sir. Cursor is visible. Yeah. Cursor is visible. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so you know, like say, uh, consider this as the sun. So you can see that uh, the to detect Earth, the wobbling, uh, uh, you know, like the wobble due to Earth, the sun wobbles only about a factor of nine centimeters or something. And uh, these are the various, uh, uh, you know, like k values that an instrument must have to determine uh, this kind of uh, planets. And this, this. Um, um, this blue region is basically the habitable zone. So how does one define a habitable zone? One defines a habitable zone is that the zone which is at the right distance from the uh, host star, that if a planet exists, then the temperature will be, you know, like not cooler than maybe minus 70 degrees Celsius and not hotter than plus 80 or 90 degrees Celsius. So, which can effectively mean that some organic com compounds can, can uh, uh, but this is, in this, you know, the, uh, the, the effect of the, you know, atmosphere of the planets and all, they are not considered. This is just based on the, 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 the effective temperature or equivalent temperature of the surface of the planet where, because of just the distance from the host star. Of course, this is subject to many more effects. So for example, if you can see this in this, the Earth is on the uh, edge of the habitable zone, but Mars is well inside. But we all know that Mars has very thin atmosphere, and so it is beyond habitable uh, habitable conditions. Uh, so, but whereas Earth uh, is still today, it is habitable, and you know, like because it has a right atmosphere and uh, that protects, which protects the earth from extreme environment. So in, uh, so in this blue color, you know, that uh, atmosphere effect is not considered. This is just the, the distance uh, between the planet and the earth and the host star. Okay, so coming back to the, our radial velocity, uh, um, uh, coming back to the, uh, the distribution of the planet so far discovered, we know more than 5,000 planets and they're, uh, you know, like of which about 1,000, 1,200 masses are about uh, accurately known more than with accuracy more than 50%. And uh, here you can see that what are the uh, limits here. Say, for example, this is 10 centimeter limit, this is 50 centimeter limits. You can see there are very few spectrographs that can go below these 50 centimeters. Most do around one meter kind of thing. And so that's why, you know, like still, you know, detecting uh, art like in the habitable zone is still a little bit uh, distant dream, but hopefully, you know, like next uh, two the few decades, probably this, uh, this will be achieved. But you can see actually, you know, like there's a lot of uh, gaps here where there are more, uh, you know, discovery biases are there. So you have more discoveries here and less discover discoveries are there. They, the, the field is, uh, you know, partly populated here or almost not populated here. So. 
Okay, so 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 in 2007, you know, I came back, I uh, returned from US and joined Physical Research Laboratory and to start this exoplanet science program. Okay, that time, you know, like uh, today, a lot of institutes are showing a lot of interest and people are actively uh, participating. And I'm very happy that uh, at Pune, this program is going on. So this is like some kind of a dream for me because, you know, when I started this uh, in 2007, most people were not even worried about this subject. And I had to push a lot of uh, people to get my funds and uh, convince them that this is a, a very big science to do and, uh, and should be done where, you know, like in developed world, this is being done. So India should also join the, the research in this field. So uh, fortunately, I was able to convince, uh, you know, the PRL uh, director, the then PRL director and uh, I'm the Department of Space and they gave me money to start the project. So I started this program at the time with the idea of, you know, build a radial velocity uh, spectrograph with the existing 1.2 meter telescope. Well, that time itself I had asked for a larger telescope, but they simply very politely said, no, no, you first prove your spectrograph with 1.2 meter telescope, then we can think of having a bigger telescope. Okay, one of the main issue is that, you know, you need dedicated time, a lot of time to do this. In the course of my lecture, I will explain why we need so much of time. So, a lot of dedicated time is not available in large telescopes because they are oversubscribed. Okay, so that's where it comes like when I say smaller telescope, typically the size will be like two to four meter class telescopes where, you know, like a relatively large amount of time is possible to get so that, you know, one can uh, uh, at least, you know, 30 to 40 percent of time on these telescopes so that, you know, you can actually uh, get, uh, uh, you know, like uh, get to determine uh, whether a planet is there around the star or not. Remember that discovering a planet uh, around the star is almost mostly like serendipity in, in spite of the fact that, you know, we have so many, you know, transit surveys which gives probable candidates. But Many times, you know, like uh, the false positives are pretty high, up to fifty percent. So, so that's why you need lot of uh, lot of time on small telescope to do this job. And uh, I thought probably, you know, like you know, with one one point two meter, let me start the program and slowly I can get to uh, have a have a bigger telescope to do it. So it took almost uh, two thousand seven to two thousand seventeen, and like. 10 years and then now 23, 2023. So, you know, like almost like 14, 15 years uh, that, you know, like it took for me to come to this level. So uh, that's how well, in today's talk, I'll be mostly talking about that journey. Okay, so uh, when you do, uh, do precision uh, measurements, real velocity measurements with, uh, with a spectrograph, you need a really very precise uh, spectrograph to do, and you should actually know how what is your instrument limit. So, if you consider a say a resolution of sixty thousand, let us say, uh, okay. So, at sixty thousand resolution, if you consider uh, by definition, what do you mean by resolution of a spectrograph or a spectral line? Is typically you know if you assume a Gaussian line, then you call it as FWHM kind of thing, full width at half maximum of the Gaussian. So that Gaussian, if you consider 60,000 resolution, then at 5,500 will correspond to, uh, you know, like roughly around five to six kilometer per second. But remember, we are talking of few meters per second or, you know, centi few centimeters, 10 centimeter, 30, 40 centimeter per second. So how, how do you get down to that level from, you know, like few kilometers per second? That is one challenge. Okay. Uh, so that can be done in two ways. Uh, one is the you can the, to begin with you know what the easier easier way is to use a iodine cell, okay. So more, this was the most popular uh, method in the US, uh, you know like which was the Hydes uh, Caltech Hydes with the cake they they used that and most spectrographs in the beginning in nineties were actually and even after two thousand ten or two thousand fifteen they were using this actually, okay. So the way it is done is that uh, the starlight is passed through the you know iodine cell, which is under temperature control and all, and uh, 
what you do is that you uh, whose iodine has a definite absorption spectra when the starlight passes through that absorption spectra uh, to the through the iodine cell you get uh, some kind of, some absorption spectra in the star and uh, you use that as a calibration uh, calibration and with respect to those absorption features because that absorption feature is the, coming from the iodine cell which is at the same reference frame as you are with the rest frame. So with respect to that, how much is the shift on the lines? So you calculate and measure it. Because if you, you understand that, you know, like if there is a change of temperature of one degree Celsius uh, in the in the ambient or a shift of uh, uh, shift of uh, one millibar in the atmosphere, then the, the instrument will shift or drift the lines will drift by 100 meters per second. So how do you ca calibrate your spectrograph to, can, to take out those uh, intrinsic spectrograph uh, shifts is through this kind of iodine cell measurements. The downfall is that, is that this iodine cell works only between 5,000 and 6,000. And so, and so, you know, like you need a lot of photons because the range is very small. And plus, you know, like the lot of starlight is is wasted because of the absorption features. So you need very pretty large telescopes to do this kind of work, like ten meter, eight meter class telescope or six meter class. On a one one meter class telescope or two meter class telescopes, uh, if you do iodine cell measurements, you can hardly reach maybe like six, seven magnitude or something. You cannot go fainter than that. Okay. The other method is that you use, uh, you know, like starlight in one is the fiber fed spectrograph in which, you know, making the instrument is very difficult because here, although you are dating, you are, in terms of efficiency, it, it is much more efficient than the iodine cell, uh, iodine cell method because here in this case, uh, you are using the entire light of the, uh, entire light of the, uh, of the star. There is no cell absorption cell in between, and uh, you are keep, you are making the spectrograph putting in a very stable environment. Like you put it in the entire spectrograph, put it in uh, in a vacuum chamber. You control the temperature at a level of one milli kelvin. That is, if you are keeping the spectrograph at twenty five degrees Celsius, it should be the should be twenty five degree plus plus minus point zero zero one degree Celsius. So that should be the stability. Okay, and then you use two fibers. On one fiber, you have the uh, you have the star spectra itself, and in another fiber, you have a calibration light, which can be a thorium spectral lamp, which can be a laser frequency comb, or which, which can be uh, can be a uranium spectral lamp. So by doing this, what happens is that you are having in situ calibration simultaneously, and the spectrograph is under stable condition. So therefore, you know, like you are able to uh, calibrate the spectra, you are able to know how much the spectra, spectrograph has shifted during the observations or, or between two sets of or 10 sets of observations of T1, T2, T3, T4, and so on. Okay, now this, although this second method is more efficient because it goes from all the way from 3800 to 67, 7000 angstrom, uh, but you know, like making such a spectrograph is, is most challenging because you have to be a spectrograph size is like you know a few meters by few meters and you have to make a very big chamber to uh, to put it in a vacuum and the most difficult to have a temperature control of one millikelvin. I mean that is the most challenging stuff. So having said all these things, so I will come jump down to the uh, parallel spectrograph. Here you can see that. You have the you know the optical fiber coming from the telescope end to the slit position, and then you have the you know like uh, here is the e shell, and here is the you know like prism cross dispersor, and then here you have the uh, here you have the camera lens, you have the shutter, and you have the CCD, and you know these are two off-axis uh, parabolas. So this is a white people design. So by white people you mean that you know like after cross dispersion. Uh, after uh, first this dispersion, the lights are not spreading away, but you are, it is recollimated back. Is, so uh, this uh, M1 is recollimating it, uh, uh, and uh, 
putting it back to M2, and then it uh, the collimator being uh, being goes to the preserve uh, and the cross dispersal. That is why this is called cross dispersal because in a shell, what happens is that you are uh, at a very high resolution. People, those who have ideas that in a shell you have. Uh, at one go and a single shot, you are going from 3800 to 7000 uh, angstrom. And each uh, consisting of order, say, uh, 150, uh, 152 at the blue end, uh, at the indigo end, and, uh, and the red end, uh, 7000 will be around, I think, 80 order. So from 80 to you know, 152, which is like almost like 70, 70 orders. Uh, no. So 70 orders, each order, uh, uh, you know, like will be of typically, you know, like uh, like 50 to 80 and so long. And suppose if you are not using cross dispersal, so directly you have this and directly, you know, you put the camera lens here instead of here, you put the camera lens and put. So what will happen is that all the orders will fall on top of each other. Okay, they will appear like line one, line two, line three, line four, line this, each line is one spectra of AT and so. So, so they will all top, fall on top of each other. So then, you know, all the lights will be mixed. What do you get a white light actually? Okay, so uh, because, because they are falling on each other. Uh, so now, you know, like, so you need something. So suppose the initial dispersion is in this direction, this X direction. And since all the orders are falling on each other, you need to disperse this order in the perpendicular direction, in y direction. So you will get one, one order like this, 80 order, then 81, 82, like that, with certain spacing. Okay, so in order to do that, this prism is useful. So the, the job of this prism is to, you know, disperse the light in the perpendicular to orthogonal direction of the Ishan. Okay, so if Ishan is dispersing in x axis, uh, the prism will they should disperse in the y-axis. So then you will get the full 2D pattern of the spectra of in one shot from uh, 3800 angstrom to uh, 7000 angstrom. So then you will get in some in my few forthcoming slides here, yeah, I will give an example of the uh, how the spectra looks like. So you get the spectrum. Okay, so now this is as I said, the spectrograph has to be inside a vacuum chamber. And so this is the vacuum chamber and this is the, you know, like the temperature control chamber. This room is a temperature control chamber. You can actually see that inside the big vacuum chamber, there's a small vacuum chamber which hosts, uh, hosts the CCD. Remember the CCD detector has to be cooled at a level of minus 115 degrees Celsius and it has to be very high vacuum. That like by minus six, not very high, but moderately high, minus six millibar, 10 to the minus six millibar. Whereas the big chamber can be at a level of, you know, like minus two milli, 10 to the power minus two millibar or minus three millibar. So that should be fine. So here is the inside picture where you can see that the off axis parabolas, prism, cosmic precision, this is the A shell, fold mirror, and this is camera optics, and this is the fiber fed. And this should give you, I think, a total idea of the how the spectrograph looks like, the pulse one on the 1.2 meter. Okay, and these are the fibers, you know, fiber feed through. These blue color fibers, they are coming from the telescope flow. Okay, and it is entering through this uh, vacuum feed source. Okay, so this is how the spectra looks like typically. So this is a spectra of Tau City, is a very famous star. Uh, it's a, like 3.5 magnitude star. And why people, everybody observe this star? Because this star is known as a radial velocity standard star. It's like a can candle star by which you can actually measure because this star is very stable, astrophysically, that is, it doesn't oscillate or whatever. And also it doesn't seem to have any planet at a level of down to 30 centimeter K value. It may have something, maybe outside once, uh, you know, we do not know right now, but people have observed this with a precision of 30 centimeter and still found it is flat. There is no oscillation. So, so if you want to calibrate your spectrograph, you know, against such a star, then you know, okay, on sky, what is your, you know, achievement? So that's why almost all, there are some 10, 15 such stars available of the sky, bright stars. Why bright stars? Because you need a good signal to another issue to calibrate your uh, spectrograph. So you do that and then you know that, okay, your, uh, your, uh, uh, spectrograph is capable of intrinsic capable of this kind of stability. So this is the you know um, the full uh, 
a beautiful uh, you know electricity image of the spectra so this is the blue end and this is the red end so this is the prism so you know the prism disperses more in the blue side and less in the red side so therefore you know that the on the blue side the orders are dispersed more so there is a larger gap between consecutive orders whereas here it is uh, uh, you know like close closer to each other so that's how the how the design has to be made so that uh, you know like you you know like okay given your ccd format and all and uh, you know the uh, the orders should not be too close and should not be too far from each other that within the ccd format you should uh, be able to cover the entire uh, uh, entire uh, what you call um, the spectra from 3800 to 7000 angstrom or if some people want to go up to 9000 angstrom that is also possible so people do that okay so now and this is the small inset where it shows that you know like uh, to fire uh, it was spectra from the both the fibers one fiber said that we do simultaneous so here you have the you know, thorium spectra uh, and then you have the star spectra and then you can see the you know, some of the absorption features of the star Okay, at say uh, sixty-five thousand and these are the bright spots are basically you know like the bright argon lines from the calibration spectra that comes. So obviously you know these these small portions get little spoiled because of this uh, bright thing. So you cannot do anything about it. Of course, uh, you can put some filters uh, here, uh, but that depends upon how you put that part of the star spectra is. Fortunately, this is beyond 7,000 actually. Actually, a Paris one goes up to 9,000. So this up to this is 7,000 and this part is uh, done for the other spectral analysis, not radial velocity. Radial velocity is typically carried up to this. Why? Because beyond this, you get a lot of water absorption lines, which are coming from Earth's atmosphere. You can see actually some of these deep absorption lines. Here. These are water absorption lines from the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, so these lines actually, you know, like uh, well, because of these lines, and uh, it's difficult to do the radial velocity uh, estimation in this region actually. And also, the star number of lines that star has here is much less and much more on this side. And so, therefore, you know, like the, this side of the spectra is more useful for doing radial velocity. Okay. So this is again a sample spectra of the star. Uh, you know, like you can see how the jungle of spectral lines are seen at 65,000. So this is between 4832, 4880. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, here I will talk about the cross correlation uh, technique. See, I remember I told that uh, we have this uh, what you called. Um, we have this. Um, mm, uh, the, if you measure the consider simply the FWG of the star, it is uh, basically, you know, uh, uh, that is, if you consider this FWG here to here, you have basically, you know, like five kilometers per second or something. So from that, how do you do this uh, two meters per second? The only you do is that, that you create a mask and you choose uh, photospheric lights. By photospheric lights, I mean uh, lights that are coming out from the photosphere of the star. And why photosphere of the star? Because the photosphere we need. Remember, we are trying to see uh, the determine the wobble, whether the star is wobbling or not. So, with, if you want to know the, whether the star is wobbling or not, means that you are assuming that the, even though it's a gaseous ball, you are basically assuming that it's one one ball, ball of hot gas which is uh, acting as one single ball, and there is not much of differential, uh, you know, like velocity rotations. And uh, so that you know, uh, you know, you can accurately measure the wobble of the star. So, so the uh, since the star is not a solid body, it's a gaseous body. We have to find uh, find the part of that star for that portion of the star which is you know like co-rotating with the star itself. Okay, and that is the photospheric part. Okay, if you go to the corona or some other place or uh, for stratosphere or, you know, like uh, uh, chromosphere, not stratosphere, chromosphere. So from photosphere, if you go to chromosphere, the chromosphere do not co-rotate or corona not at, does not even co-rotate. It has its own dynamics, so totally different size. Okay. So if you try to pick up those lines, because when you get the star spectra, you get all lines, lines arising from photosphere, lines arising from the, the chromosphere and arising from corona or whatever. 
Okay, so so you have to select only those those lines which are mostly you know like iron lines and uh, I think tungsten lines, tungsten lines, iron lines. Some there are metallic lines are there. Mostly the metallic lines that like those have like few EV of excitation energy. So they actually come from the from the photosphere of the star. So these uh, so therefore, what you have to do, how to differentiate that you already know what are the rest wavelength of these lines. They are about, you know, like they are basically for the sun, they are known as front of our lines because the front of our was the first person who actually, you know, like uh, walked on this and so it is named after him. Uh, so this, this front of our lines, uh, what is our uh, sun is a typical star that if the front of our lines is present in sun, it is present on stars also. And G, all G type stars will have that. So, uh, uh, not only G will have similar lines, 7K and you know, uh, and uh, late F time stars will have this kind of lines. So these lines, you know, like you make a mask and then and at the rest wavelength, and then you choose. Uh, so you run a cross correlation between the mask and the star spectra at T1, T2, T3, T4, like that. So this is the cross correlation technique. So this is the mask. So that means at the rest wavelength, you will have one. Uh, transmission at that is zero. So as you you know like move the uh, move the you know like you can see the move the uh, mask against the absorption uh, absorption uh, spectra. So what we'll have is that and multiply to the values. So uh, basically you know if, if you multiply with against zero, these are zero value and this is one. Okay, with some, some small very small. It is typically the one tenth of the uh, of the resolution of the uh, of the of the your FWHM. So so that you do sufficient sampling actually. It can be a little more than that, but typically it is done at one tenth of the FWHM. So so if you do that, then you will sample it, and when you sample it, you you will make a kind of a uh, kind of uh, there are 10,000 lines, suppose, let us say. So, entire these 10,000 lines, we, when you run the mask, you will get, you can see first, you were at this point, you will get, at this point, you will get, and this point, you will get. So, you get a cross correlation function. This is the sum total of the absorption feature of the all the 10,000 uh, uh, 10, lines by that, that, are, that are, arising, uh, are arising from the photosynth. So, you get a cross correlation, this is known as cross correlation function. So at time t1, you get a particular value of velocity here. I'll be fitted fit, this bit. Okay. So at time t2, it, uh, you have you will see uh, what is this value, whether it's the same value or it's something else. Okay. So because you know, like there are 10,000 lines of you know, like not when I mean typically the lines, depending on what type of structural line, it can vary anything between 5,000 to 8,000 lines. So uh, so, depending, uh, so if if it's a F8 late, this thing there will be like less than three thousand lines, and so the your fitting accuracy will be less. If there are like you know G8 or K5 or something, then there will be eight thousand nine thousand lines. So then it will be like you know very accurate. So for the same for photon noise and same brightness, you will get maybe like uh, you know 10, 50, 10, 20 centimeters or like that, depending upon of course your work. Now your instrument stability, the photon noise will be very small actually. Okay, and that is how you actually get down to level of, uh, you know, several tens of centimeter per second to, you know, tens of meters per second from kilometer per second. So this is the uh, cross correlation technique. Okay, so I come with the, you know, the, uh, uh, the Paris here, uh, you know, like um, observations on, uh, on uh, RV standard star, as I said, Tau City, like you have Sigma Draconis also. So for over of two years of time, or one Sigma of 1.4 meter per second was achieved. And this is on a one meter, 1.2 meter telescope is really a very good, uh, good, uh, you know, like uh, uh, what you call, is uh, is excellent actually. I, I'll have, I have a comparison table, which, which I'll show you. Okay, and then you know, like this is for Tau City. So for five, for a week, we were able to get down to seventy centimeters per second. Okay, 
And uh, so, yes, so in 2016, we had this uh, conference in extreme radio velocity. It was happened at Yale, actually. So there I had presented the paper on Paris research and all. So, and then, you know, uh, Deborah Fisher, uh, she later wrote a review paper in PSP. Uh, she actually collected all the data. Her idea was that, you know, at circa 2016, what are the, the what are what is the best possible precision achieved by various spectrographs globally? So you can actually see that that time most people were in US they were doing an iodine and you know and you know there were few only thorium argon calibrations. Remember that these are like uh, big telescopes. Uh, I mean uh, uh, bigger telescopes like five meter, three meter, two meter, and uh, sorry sorry ah what is the telescope? Uh, I think I may have. Um, is this, uh, this is the resolution precision. I think uh, okay, that part I have uh, not put it here. But yeah, uh, what I can say is that most of these, you know, like um, for example, Hydes is on Get uh, telescope, and uh, Sophie is two meter class telescope. This is one point five. These are on three point five meter telescopes, and uh, you know, HRS is uh, again, you know. Uh, I think and this is the uh, Hubble-Weldy well telescope, which is like uh, 11 meter telescope. This is Hamilton is a three meter telescope. Um, so, uh, so you can see that uh, the Paris with the 1.2 meter telescope with the Thoria monitoring, we were able to get pretty good results. Uh, we were able to get down to one meter per second with signal to noise ratio of 200. That is how the scaling was done. That for 200 signal to noise ratio per uh, per uh, resolution element. What would be the uh, uh, you know uh, what would be the resolution you can achieve? So we can see that uh, our precision was pretty high in the list. So that was very good for us, considering that you know this was our first trial uh, working in India. Okay, uh, so then you know like uh, we also did some uh, legacy results in the sense that we wanted to compare our pipeline with Para our pipeline, that is my RV pipeline, the Paris pipeline and the Hobbes pipeline. You see, the Hobbes is one of the most established uh, spectrograph, which has, in the, uh, you know, on a 3.5 meter, and that time it was showing 80 centimeters. So what we basically did is that we took uh, the Hobbes data on Tau City. Okay. And uh, that is uh, uh, publicly available. And we run our pipeline on the HAPS data and we try to see whether we get the same result as that of HAPS pipeline does. And we do get that. So which means that uh, data, our data pipeline is really good. And that's why we have said that it is a legacy result. Uh, in my next slide, I will show you why, why we have we said that actually. Okay. Um, but before I do that, I want to also uh, uh, tell you one more thing is that why it is actually difficult to go beyond below one meter per second. This is something, you know, like to understand the philosophy of it, is that when we may, when the starlight is dispersed on a CCD detector, what we are measuring by doing this, you know, how much shift is there, you know, where type D1, D2, we are trying to measure length actually. Okay. And as I said, that the resolution of, you know, like uh, five kilometers, the MWHM, and typically MWHM would be like three to five pixels. And each pixel may be 15 micron. These are say, uh, silicon CCD detectors, silicon wafers. So if you uh, now if you want to go from that effectively, which means that when you are trying to find out precisely statistically that how precisely you are able to measure your uh, bottom of your absorption feature or cross correlation feature feature, you are basically here. If you look at this, you are basically trying to see you know a 10 centimeter per second is basically in this you know like. The silicon uh, wafer electron micro this thing you can see one nanometer is this so you are trying if you want to go 10 centimeter per second you are try basically trying to see distance between you know like for 10 centimeter means you are trying to like some few nanometers length distance you are trying to measure and that is the that is the basically you know the the limit we are facing actually trying to get down to 10 centimeter or 9 centimeter so that we can detect our earth going around a sun like star at one end from from away from the poster. So this was I thought the the philosophy is uh, is uh, I wanted to show that why is where we are currently stuck actually. Okay. 
even though now you know that is the that I will show you with espresso that 10 centimeter per second is some people you know like the uh, general observatory are able to achieve. Okay, the another milestone that you know through Paris we were able to achieve was that you know like in, in 2016 the NASA NSF knew its spectrograph uh, was granted to Penn State where I was part of you know like uh, that program because you know like uh, you know like because of our results with Paris so we had uh, I had some collaboration at Penn State and so you know like I I was part of the team. And that in that team, we actually told NASA that, okay, we already have uh, on a one meter telescope, we have already shown that, you know, like we can get down to like one meter per second. And then we have this pipeline and then we have this, uh, what you call, um, you know, the prism cross disperser and the, because that time there were some ideas whether, you know, like a prism, because uh, the large prism can be, uh, effectively, you know, like because prism is very sensitive to temperature, uh, temperature uh, environment. Okay, because it's a glass after all. It's just a huge piece of glass. Okay, so he, I mean this big. So uh, it's a huge piece of glass. So therefore, you know, like uh, whether that can be effectively controlled or not. The path in Paris one, we actually showed that that yes, at certain level we can definitely control it. So because of that, you know, like the need that inherits the heritage of prism and the data direction pipeline from Paris, and then it was acknowledged. So that was another, you know, like for Paris contribution uh, as a as a example. Apart from you know, like doing actual exoplanet uh, discoveries, it showed that okay, you know, like this can be obtained, and also. Uh, another important thing is that you know, as I showed you in that previous slide here. Uh, you know, like in US, most of people were using iodine only. We were using uh, uh, thorium argon and the European groups, like uh, this is Geneva group, half north, half south, and Sophie. Okay, this is the French people who basically is part of collaboration of this. They were using the argon. So they have their own you know, pipeline, actually. That is the reason this is the same pipeline as the half pipeline. That is why, you know, like we are the people who actually, you know, like worked out this so that's showing that yes we are also doing that and so this this pipeline was you know like was demonstrated uh, uh, to NASA that okay you know like we have equally, equally you know developed this which is at par with the you know the Genoa people and because earlier you know no, no other institute within US was doing this uh, um, thorium argon thing now some people are doing like Deborah Mission are sort of doing new is doing and there are I think Kardik is also coming up with uh, this guy, the, this method, and they have they have developed their own uh, software pipeline for that. Okay, that time in 2016 it was not so, so that's why you know like it was considered as uh, uh, heritage actually. Okay, uh, that uh, we were independent, more or less independently developed this whole program. We of course uh, we had a talk with the Geno Observatory, and uh, they shared their uh, mask with us. And uh, then we, we developed our whole uh, program and then did the whole thing. And that's why, you know, that comparison with the hops uh, uh, was necessary. Actually. Okay, uh, so I will now come to like, the, what is the latest position is that as you can see that with espresso, this slides I got from Francisco Pepe who is the director of General Observatory. Uh, you know, like we have this, uh, mm, they are claiming that the, with, uh, you know, on the eight meter VLT, they are able to really get down to like a 10 centimeter uh, instrument precision. Okay, not on sky, but instrument. And on sky, they are getting for one month about 62 centimeter per second. Okay, you can see these are the points in the, this thing. So, so, you, so you can still see that, you know, like uh, we are a little far away from achieving on sky 10 centimeter per second. Okay, so this is the, uh, of course, the letter on private communication with him told me that uh, they have updated their pipeline and all those things. They are able to reach about, on a single night, about 30 centimeters. Yes, on a single night, they are able to get to 30 centimeters, but over a month, about 50 to 60 centimeters per second. Okay, uh, I will now come to, you know, like some of the few discoveries that we did in uh, with Paris from India. So this was in 2018, this, we had observed this source for about uh, 
uh, you know, like uh, two years, close to close to two years, uh, and uh, you know, like this was a probable candidate, and this is a twenty-seven atmos uh, object with substratum uh, called as substratum, and that time only you know, like uh, twenty-three uh, such uh, planets were known that had whose uh, uh, of substratum mass. Uh, Subsatan classification is basically from uh, 20 art mass to you know like 50, 60 art mass. Okay, Saturn is like 90 art mass. Uh, so that is the Subsatan or Super Neptune range. And so only 23 of them, this was the 23rd whose mass was known at with an accuracy of more than 50% precision. Okay. Uh, so remember, you know, like uh, uh, see, Kepler shows or test shows a lot of, or K2 shows a lot of, uh, uh, you know, transit method, so a lot of candidacy shows, and uh, you have false positive probabilities there. So basically, you know, then we have to do the false positive probability, negate the false positive probability, and then we go, once you do that and show, no, this is only a planet, nothing else, then the discovery is acknowledged. Unless you do that, the discovery is not acknowledged. So, uh, so to do that, we had to spend over two years of time on this uh, 1.2 meter because, you know, like because the K value was of the order of six meter per second and which is, uh, you know, like uh, basically uh, mm, close to the standard uh, seismologic this thing. So we had to observe for almost two years to show that it is coming from planet and not because of some other phenomena. Okay, because if other phenomena are quasi periodic, so we, so if it is a planet, to come planet, it will be there for, it will be there as long as the planet is there, and so you, you observe today, you observe after ten years, you should still see it. But typically, the other phenomena, astrophysical phenomena, seismology phenomena, or you know, star spot activity, or these kind of activities, or flares, or uh, the radio resolution, because of those stuff. They will come and go and will vanish. So you know, like when you get, when do you do the observations uh, for a longer time? Then you know what. Uh, if it is a false positive, it will go away. If it is not, then it will continue. And this is the reason why you need high cadence observations. And this is the reason why you need a lot of telescopes and a lot of telescope time to do this kind of work, which are not often not available on a larger telescope. So this is the same source about Hitlerly. This was a K2 curve, and this is the uh, you know spectral classification of the whole star. Okay, I just, this is another of the hot Jupiter observations that we did. And uh, uh, here, actually, earlier one we were able, we had to spend because it was six meter. We were had to spend almost two years. Here we were one or two months. We could finish all thing because why the K value is large. So there is no you know like. Uh, K value is, uh, you know, like of the order of 60, 70 meters per second. So there is no, basically any, uh, any, any uh, interference with the stellar seismology because stellar seismology and other player stuff, the K values of the order of few meters per second to sub meter per second. So the trouble starts when you try to detect smaller planets, not hot Jupiter's. Okay. So now I come to the Paris 2. If you remember that, you know, like when I initially started, I wanted to have a bigger telescope. So eventually, you know, like we got this uh, uh, Department of Space agreed that, okay, you know, like uh, in 2016, that, okay, you go ahead with a bigger telescope. Because uh, again, you know, like uh, with, with there are a couple of two meter class telescopes or even at least 3.6 meter class telescopes, which are uh, national facilities and they are oversubscribed. So if you want to get 30, 40% reserve time for exoplanets research is not possible to get. So, and also we needed a telescope which can also do target of opportunity observations for NOVA and supernova observations. So, so on these two clauses, uh, you know, like we were able to get the funds for the 2.5 2 meter telescope. And so these telescopes saw first light in November 2022 and it's, uh, it's an excellent telescope. And the telescope uh, was manufactured in Belgium and it was uh, based on uh, the parameters that we had uh, fixed. And uh, so we had, uh, you know, like here you can see the, there's a paint object camera is there. 
and the porous cassegrain unit is on the other side and you can see this fiber coming out the two fibers for porous and this is the porous spectrograph this is almost uh, the, the size of this uh, spectrograph length is almost four meter and diameter is 1.5 meter so and this is inside a whole room so this whole room is uh, controlled at a temperature level of 10 millikelvin so that inside this vacuum chamber we get one millikelvin okay and the vacuum is uh, 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 kept it as a, as a stability of 0 0.03 millibar okay okay so this is these are the if you look at the you know, comparison between paras one and paras two you can see instead of prism we are using a grism here because uh, here we wanted to go even, you know, like very precise temperature control. So, because we, our idea was to get to some one meter, so we simply adapted the prism design of a halves and they were kind to share with us. And uh, so, this prism is designed in such a way that uh, whatever temperature deviation is there, light deviation is there because of the uh, in the prism, because of the, uh, because of the uh, temperature deviation. Uh, the the temperature of the grating which is pressed on one surface of the of the uh, <clears throat> of the uh, prism, uh, it acts in the opposite direction. So the that that effect is close to zero. Okay. So uh, I mean one can uh, one can uh, uh, you know like uh, do this combination test in various ways. So the glass that was used by Harps was not available. So we used some other glass and then redesigned the prism slightly to modify it. And then, uh, then we were able to get our own prism actually. But basic design uh, uh, design structure was similar. The prism part only, not the other part, uh, was, uh, which is this one, this is the cross distance of it. The other part uh, were our own design. Okay, so we designed this, and then you can see that this is working at uh, 110,000 resolution, and uh, you know, like uh, so. Uh, so, uh, and also we had this, um, you know, um, this uh, telescope also has a tipped-in facility to do the first order correction. So, therefore, the the PSF of the star on the fiber tip is very well stabilized. So you have this uh, F8 wave from the telescope, and then you have this uh, guide this thing, and it, uh, it corrects. And uh, and then you have this focal plane. This F8 is converted into F4, and then it goes to the star. And this uh, focal plane CCD is there, which measures before you put the star is put here. If uh, image is put on the star, this moves here. This is on an actuator, so an actuator plane, which can move the fiber of the CD with a precision of one to two microns. Okay, so the fiber uh, core is about uh, 75 microns. So at 75 micron can positions with the precision of one to two microns, I will say that's pretty good. So that's what we do. And uh, this is the ADC atmospheric dispersion corrector. And so the whole thing goes like, so once you go, first you the, uh, the CCD comes here and then you get the entire, uh, and the image of the starlight, you can measure the seeing. The seeing with the 2.5 meter is excellent. Typically we get 0.5 arc second to 0.8 arc second if the sky is good. Otherwise, worst case, it will be 1.2 arc second. So the seeing what we are, but with this is this is what happens if you know if you have a telescope with active optic system under the prime millimeter. So while the 1.2 meter shows you a two arc second seeing this fellow sitting next to next to the 1.2 meter shows you 1.8 arc second. So that, that's the kind of technology advancement that happens. Okay, this is without any additive optics, without the tip. Okay. On top of it, if you run the tip tilt, you will get better. But we usually do not run the tip tilt at this full capacity of 40 hertz. We our because we our aim is to you know like uh, uh, you know like just to make sure that the fiber is uh, very uh, the star image on the fiber is very stable because if there is a movement of 0.5 arc second, we can get an artificial jump of some few meters per second on the radial velocity. So it has to be stabilized at that level. So therefore, you know, like that's the reason of uh, this tip tilt is kept. I will mean, work it as two to three hertz. But the seeing anyway is good. So that's hard way. Okay. So and this is the simulation of the you know the spectrograph with the showing the optical reversing, and this you can actually see the 
the liquid nitrogen tank is well outside the this whole length is about this detector is somewhere here and the liquid nitrogen tank is here the 10 liter and so you know like this whole uh, distance is roughly about you know like 80 to 180 centimeter one meter close to one meter actually so that you know like any liquid nitrogen, this is done through you know closed cycling pipe through which uh, you know, you get liquid nitrogen goes in every 22 hours, we have to fill it, but so therefore we, uh, we fill it early morning after the observation around 6 o'clock in the morning and uh, around uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, well before the uh, uh, you know, observation start. Because remember, we have to have a temperature control at about 1 millikelvin. So the act of this liquid nitrogen actually gives a depth of like about 5 millikelvin, 0 0.005, 0 0.005. So, and then it takes a stabilized to get about, you know, like one hour or so. So therefore, if you, uh, if you fill it at four o'clock, then, you know, like by six o'clock or, you know, 6.30, it is, uh, the whole system is stabilized. So that's the timing that you do. Okay, so here you can, before we actually made the, all these things, we had that some simulation that if across the room, Remember, I showed that the whole room, if there is a across the room, you have a temperature difference of 0.01 uh, at 24 degrees Celsius, say. So then across the vacuum chamber from this end to this end, the temperature variation will be of the order of 0.002 degrees Celsius, peak to value. Okay, this is, this is a simulation using thermal, uh, SOLIDWORKS uh, thermal uh, module. Uh, <coughs> So actually, we actually see this actually, I will show you, okay. Okay, so now, you know, like before I go further, you can see this um, whole spectrograph here, you know, getting assembled in Ahmedabad, in PRL, and here also we are testing the, you know, on vacuum and all, then it is shifted to the observatory and here it is being getting inside the observatory, it was one of those anxious moments that, you know, like everything should go and you know like nothing should fall or whatever you can see how precarious the things are and so but everything went smoothly and so you can see that we can get down to minus six level vacuum here in the big chamber also and then you know over over 48 hours it goes down to 10 to minus two so every every afternoon if you pump it for some half an hour then you go to minus six and during the first 18 hours, it goes down to 10 to the power of minus uh, about, uh, yeah, about five into minus three. So basically we are working at three into minus three millibar level. But over time, you know, like it is going to expect, uh, because if you don't open the uh, vacuum chamber, you could do it months after months after months. Obviously, you know, like your degassing will decrease, keep on decreasing and the level in will get much stable. So I am told halves actually pumps now after so many years pumps once in a week. Okay, so hopefully after a few years we we'll come to that level, but you know, like uh, this is fine for us right now. So again, you know, like um, this is the whole basic various parameters that I have listed of the Paras 2. And um, this is in fact the highest resolution spectrograph in the country and probably, you know, like globally only few such exist at the moment, I think six or seven. Okay. So um, this is the, you know, like we have uh, the Cassegrain unit that I talked about, you know, that goes in front of the tip tilt unit. And yes, so now you can actually see that this is the vacuum chamber, this is the inner room in the outer room. So there is a two, two level, actually three level of temperature control. The outer room is with AC and all this thing, it goes to at 0.1 degree. This room goes at 0 0.010 millikelvin and the vacuum chamber gives 0 0.02, 1 0 0 0.002. And actually you can see this here, temperature, this is over a month. And this is over uh, 24 hours, you can see it's 0 0.002, the one that we, we saw in the solid box simulation. And so these are the, you know, the variations. And so the RMS is about 0 0.01 or even much less than that. So, so okay, so this is again comparison Paras 1 and Paras 2. Uh, so this is the entire spectra of the, you know, the Paras 2 on a single fiber. Uh, I will show you the two fiber spectra also. 
uh, the single fiber, and then you can decide using uranium lines, and you can see the comparison of the resolution at 110,065. It really, you know, like very good. Okay. And so, uh -huh, yes, okay, these are the two fibers. So you can see the intrinsic stability of the of the PARS2 is 34 centimeter right now. I mean, 30 to 40 centimeters, or sometimes get 30, okay. Uh, sometimes we get 25 also. This one, but typically, you know, we get around 30, 35. Okay, so these are, uh, so you have uh, both the fibers, uh, you have the you have the um, uh, on both the fire on both the fibers you have the uranium spectra, uh, and so you can see this uh, beautiful star spectra. And then this is the star spectra, and this is you can see the star spectra, and this is HD triple five seven five. This was obtained like last week actually, and uh, and you can see this is the thing. And so so while you have these at thirty four centimeter level, and this is can see that we are showing at them to to three days data. Uh, here you can actually see it is uh, 50 centimeter we get and on a single night it is as good as 20 centimeter per second. Okay, so um, um, yes, so they basically, you know, like, uh, so that shows that, you know, like uh, we are on track, still some, you know, uh, small, small, you know, software stuff has to be done and some ADC has to be properly optimized. ADC is not fully optimized though. But hopefully in one or two months, everything we are actually observing every night with Paris 2 and doing calibrations on the RV sources, thunder stars, as well as there is had some uh, test objects we also we are following it. Okay, so now uh, I want to say that you know, like so what uh, you know, like what I, I talked about astrosismology and all these things. So you can see that uh, what kind of uh, oscillations you get like 15 minute oscillations, one hour oscillation, 15 to two, two days of 15 minute to two days oscillations, and there you know a few meter per second and all those things. Okay, so therefore it is therefore once you want to detect super hours, you have to observe a particular source maybe over a year or few years before you can actually definitely say it is because of that and nothing else. Even though you know like you have some kind of uh, you know even if it is a you know transit candidate and all. Uh, of course, then you may not have, you can do it depending on what is your signal to noise ratio and what is your signal level detection. Still, you know, one year observations are necessary often to, you know, detect a uh, super art. So that actually, you know, that's why we have some 30 to 35 percent dedicated time with Paris to 1.5, we will have. So, so cadence is very necessary. So cadence, you can see that, you know, like, K is the K value, suppose, and then N is the total number of uh, observations. So K by RVMS is equal to square root of total, uh, of course, total, total number of observations. So that is how you know it is, is defined, actually. Okay. And uh, you can see, actually, from here, I don't know dedicated excellent work, no available on last telescopes. So number of observations, you want to take 100, uh, you know, like, and these things, so if you want to go to like, you know, like uh, this uh, um, K by sigma value. So you can see that, you know, like you need really lot of, uh, lot of number of observations. And same thing here, you can see that if you have a single photon noise of say like 20, 40, 60, 80, so if you consider that, okay, 50, so if you have 50, then, you know, like in one year, you know, like this was from Peter Plevichan and uh, David Latham, so they had uh, based on some private communication. So they had, uh, had some uh, talk somewhere. So I happened to attend that and uh, borrowed the slide from them actually. And to have a better, you know, like understanding, tell people actually, and I like their work actually. I think it's probably published also in some astro, Probably it is published in Astro PS by then. I'm not sure. Okay, so one day I've tried to read that if you have, have a hypothetical four meter class telescope and do like a project of HabX kind of thing and 170 targets. And, uh, um, so, what will be the timeline to do this kind of completely detect? We say that whether, you know, like 100% confidence that there is a plan around blind 170, blind 170 targets. So, 
you can see that uh, the uh, if you have single photon noise less and less, then you can do the survey complete in 10 years. Otherwise, it can go to a very unrealistic number, actually. So, so that's the and that's also the minimum survey time. So this actually also gives the uh, tells us that why it is prudent to have a lot of time on you know small or medium class telescopes like two to four meter class telescopes. Of course, we saw the habitable thing. Okay. And this is another thing that, you know, not the same, the same talk is that, you know, see four meter thing, uh, what is the kind of, uh, see, with collecting area difference between a 2.5 meter telescope, four meter is only 2.5, so it's a one magnitude difference. So what they can achieve on a, um, on a four meter telescope, we can do that with a one magnitude difference on a 2.5 meter telescope, but cost, issue you say that uh, uh, in terms of Indian rupees, you know, like uh, today's cost for a 2.5 meter telescope will be close to 150 to 400 crore rupees, including everything. Whereas if you want to buy a build a four meter class telescope, it will go to like uh, almost, you know, like uh, 400 crore or even a little more time. So factor of two cost is not benefit is there. So that's what it is. Okay, so here's a small video that I wanted to show you all the far spectrum now. It shows the you can see the e shell, you can see the off axis parabola before. You can see now. These are these are the off axis parabolas. This is a fold mirror. Here is a fold mirror. And here is a fiber coming in blue fiber. This is a detector shutter, actually. This is the camera lens. And this is the Isha, that one, big Isha from the search of ratings. Okay, I'll just, just skip this. Okay, so I thank you for listening. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Hello. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so we can start the question answer session. Yeah, I probably have offshooted the time, I think, right? No, 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 we are in time, sir. Okay. So we request participants to unmute themselves and ask questions. So how many participants we have now? Uh, so we have a total 60, uh, 58 participants. Yes, okay. yeah. These are from across India or who to Pune? Yeah, uh, three to four participants are uh, from uh, abroad. Others are from India. Okay. Uh, participants, we request you to raise uh, your hand so that. Uh, can I? I, I, can uh, I will be able to hear the uh, question, or you know, you will hear it and you will. Uh, no, no, we, we, we have changed the settings, sir. So participant can ask question directly. So okay. Varun has raised the hand. Varun, please unmute yourself and ask question. Varun, can you unmute? Varun, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go ahead, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Can you explain again the plot which was given for minimum survey time versus single measurement photon noise? And uh, uh, I couldn't understand what is the this significance. One? This one? Yes. yes, yes, sir. Yeah, so basically uh, it is like this. It is a, uh, it is basically, you know, like as I told you that there are um, um, there are, you know, like various, uh, you know, astrophysical phenomena that goes on actually. Okay. And if you want to uh, detect super arts, if you are detecting, you know, like Saturn or Hot Jupiter, then it doesn't matter. Right? Once your K value is less than 5 meter, then the problem starts. Okay. And uh, for a super earth, you know, like it may be like 40, 50 centimeter or even earth, it will be like 9 centimeter. We are not even getting that. So, uh, so the question is that, you know, like, uh, how do you it will statistically, you know, like, you, you have assumed that per star, suppose you require, you know, like, you have there are 170 targets, right? And you have, suppose, 100% time. And, uh, and it's an ideal condition. You have 
sky is no, there is no cloud, every night the sky is clear. Let us suppose. Okay. So then what happens is that, uh, then what happens is that you assume that uh, you have taken certain sets of observations. Okay. Okay. But as defined by, you know, the K by M. Okay. And, uh, and your RV RMS is the single photon noise this thing. This is. So if you, if this number is small here, okay, uh, is this number is small here, and uh, and so what happens is suppose your k value is say suppose uh, let us say fifty centimeter per second. Okay, suppose your k value is uh, fifty centimeter per second, and. Uh, let us assume that uh, you know a planet going around the star and it produces the wobble produces 50 centimeters. You are trying to detect that. So, and if you say suppose your uh, your uh, noise level is suppose 80 centimeters, so you have 50 centimeter by 80 centimeter. Then you know like it is it becomes a fraction here. Okay. So you in order to statistically do that, you will require a large number of observation and square root of that to figure it out. Okay, that is what it is. Understand? And so uh, that is the problem. Okay, but if you have say like uh, uh, say forty or twenty centimeters, so fifty divided by twenty already you are you are at a level of two sigma level. So with few observations you can do it. So therefore, you know, like uh, for a twenty, this thing, you know, you can what you can compare in, in like uh, uh, you know, like in uh, in 11 years or something, with this thing, it goes to 100 years. Because you need large number of observations. That's the thing. Am I clear? Yeah. OK, next. Yeah. OK, any more questions? Please raise your hands or unmute yourselves. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Dr. Vijit, for yeah. accepting our invitation and joining for today's talk. Uh, yeah. Dr. Ravi, would you like to say something? Oh, I just want to thank Abhijit again. Um, for yeah, it was my pleasure. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Abhijit, for uh, coming over and spending time with us here and giving some awesome lectures and basics on Real velocity. This would be the last one. And uh, Gayatri or Prachi, do we want to conclude now? Yes. Yeah. So uh, for participants, uh, we will be putting a feedback form link uh, in the chat box. And also, we have a small activity uh, while you're filling the feedback form. Uh, you can also give your feedback form. Rather, uh, we would request you to give your feedback on the uh, app uh, on the Mentimeter app. So we'll be pasting the link uh, here. So Gayatri has pasted the link for the Google form. So kindly fill up the form. This will take some time, let's say five to 10 minutes. We will be also putting it on the group on our WhatsApp group. Okay, meanwhile, uh, Gayatri, can we just take quickly a group photo? Yes, yes. I request all the participants to uh, switch on the cameras for the group photo. <clears throat> Please switch on your cameras. We are just taking few uh, photos. Gayatri. Uh... Okay. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. So, uh, meanwhile, if anyone wants to give uh, their feedback, one or two, we can we can just have. You can unmute yourself and give. That other people can just fill up the feedback form. Meanwhile, anybody would like to give their feedback, comment, suggestions. Okay. So uh, the this is this was the part two of the course. The part three, uh, which which consists of seminars and all. Uh, once the dates etc are fixed, we will let you know. We will uh, send out an email uh, for the schedule and all about the part three of the program of the course. Uh, once once we receive your feedback form, uh, the certificates would be given to all the participants. Uh, within you know eight days after we receive your feedback form, eight working days. <clears throat> okay, can I leave now? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. Pracha, I have taken few screenshots. Sorry, I had a network issue. I logged off from. Okay. My screenshot. Few screenshot. <laughs> No, I took a the screenshot. feedback form no link is already there. Um, I will just put here the Mentimeter link. Right. Prachi, uh, I think there's a hand up raised up here and uh, I will, are we concluding it now? I don't know what they want. It will take some time, uh, Dr. Ravi, but if you are like, I know you have to catch a flight, so. Yeah, <laughs> so I'll probably leave, but uh, I'll be in contact with you all later. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you for all your efforts in putting yeah. together such a nice program and we all really enjoyed it. So thank you very thank much. You I couldn't have done this without you all uh, helping thank at you. all. So <laughs> I wish Professor Kimberby was also here today. Oh, thank, you so that thank, you. thank you. In the yeah. uh, right. meeting yeah. today. today. Right. Yeah. All right. I'll log off and uh, I'll yes. talk to you all later. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Gayatri. Thank you, Prati. Wish you a safe flight. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, so I'm just putting here the link for the Mentimeter. So uh, I would request everyone to please go to www.menti.com. And sure. uh, once yeah. you go to that site. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. Thanks, Ravi. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Okay. So once you go to www.menti.com, you have to use this code. I will also put the code separately here. So, and now I will... Prachi, Varun has raised hand. Does he... Oh, Varun, Varun, you want to say something? I think it is an earlier hand up. No, I think he raised hand. Varun, do you want to ask something? Yes. Uh, yes, please. I wanted, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, it would have been better if you would have taken uh, some test or something at the end of the course or at middle so for uh, for every not for every lecture but in general mm -hmm. basic understanding for exoplanets and also some uh, based on some missions and instrumentation yeah that was the only suggestion i wanted to give uh, yes thank you for your suggestion we have a very mixed group of people here like you know we have, we have students we have phd postdoc students uh, we have faculty members who have joined in for the for the session. So it was a very mixed group of people. Uh, so that's why the test and all uh, was like avoided here. So yes, but let's see how we can do it next time if we are planning a part two of this particular course and so on. Okay, and also it, uh, it would be great if you have some other courses on other topics of lot of uh, yeah just to answer your that question pkc organizes lot of courses uh, on various topics uh, so exoplanet is one of them but uh, we have organized courses with persistent systems with isrts on data science nlp um, and we keep on doing this kind of so i would uh, request you to kindly visit our website for more details and now since you will be there in our uh, database you will be getting a lot of emails from us about the programs that we do about the lectures seminars webinars that we do okay and one uh, last thing it would be that this course was paid but uh, 
because uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of courses which are available online and they are for free so mm. some of uh, some of the people i know they did not join this course just because they thought that this would be online and there are a lot of courses available online you can easily access uh, say mit or cw or youtube lectures so it would be better if the course is a bit cheaper yeah let's see we will we'll keep all the suggestions uh, with us okay. and we'll discuss it with the uh, advita team but yeah there are you know uh, positives and uh, drawbacks limitations of a free course also we have like we have done a lot yeah. of courses that were free we will not i'm not saying it should be free it should be a little bit cheaper got it yeah theek okay. hai we will just okay. look how we can you know balance this out okay. fine sure. so uh, okay i will just project the screen for mentimeter uh, thing uh we could see some very this is a world word cloud which is generated and uh, i will just keep this on for some time once you are done uh, filling your feedback form putting your responses on the mentimeter uh, we will also share this thing on our group i hope everybody is on the group because you know um, the communication will be on the group as well as on emails so i would request everyone to be on the whatsapp group if you have not joined it yet so yes you can see the interesting uh, word <laughs> this is just a fun way to do it but yes we'll keep this uh, at our records for the course okay so thank you everyone for joining i'll just keep this meeting on and this page uh, here so that your responses are here once you give your response you can uh, you know exit from the meeting and uh, the discussions will be uh, going on on our whatsapp group and our, over emails so thank you so much everyone yesterday's and today's session so on a, a right in the trial 11th of 11th of and only few speakers have shared their presentation that those are also uploaded on the drive so there is a sub folder you can find in the same uh, recorded uh, folder yeah and uh, um, going ahead also if we receive some presentations we will be putting it on upload yeah on the drive ka folder and after 10th of march the link uh, we will be closing the link but even if after that if we receive something we will be sending it on emails so that's i think most of them So Mihir Kumar, uh, Mihir Kumar Tripathi, I can see your message here. So uh, yes, the feedback form asks for name of the institute and all. You can just say NA there. If it is not like applicable, you, yeah. you can just put NA. Rajesh, should we close the meeting? Yes, guys. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, participants. Yeah, thanks. Bye.